Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 38 Motives for Assisting the Holy Souls Examples of Holy Persons He who forgets his friend after death has taken him away from his sight, never had a true friendship. These words of Father Lainez, Second General of Society of Jesus, continually repeated to the son of St. Ignatius, he desired that the interests of souls should be as dear to them after death as they were during life. Joining example to precept, Lainez applied to the four souls in purgatory a large part of his prayers, sacrifices, and the satisfaction which he merited before God in his labors for the conversion of sinners. The fathers of the society, faithful to the lessons of charity, ever manifested a particular zeal for this devotion as may be seen in the book entitled Heroes and Victims of Charity and Society of Jesus, from which I will here transcribe but one page. At Munster, in Westphalia, towards the middle of the 11th century, an epidemic broke out, which each day swept away innumerable victims. Fear paralyzed the charity of the great part of the inhabitants, and few were found to devote themselves to relief of the unfortunate plague-stricken creatures. Then Father John Fabricus, animated with the spirit of Lyonese and Ignatius, rushed into the arena of self-sacrifice. Putting aside all personal precautions, he employed this time in the visiting of the sick and procuring remedies for them and in disposing them to die a Christian death. He heard their confessions administered the other sacraments, buried them in his own hands, and finally celebrated the holy sacrifice for the repose of their souls. In fact, during his whole lifetime, this servant of God had the greatest devotion towards the holy souls. Among all his exercises of piety, the one most dear to him, and which he always earnestly recommended, was that of offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass for the departed whenever the rubrics permitted. As a result of this council, of all the fathers in Munster, resolved to consecrate one day in each month to the faithful departed, they draped their church in black and prayed with all solemnity for the dead. God designed, as he often does, to recompense Father Fabricus and encouraged his zeal by several apparitions of the suffering souls. Some besought him to hasten their deliverance. Others thanked him for the relief he had procured for them. Others, again, announced to him the happy moment of their deliverance. The greatest act of charity was that which he accomplished at the moment of his death, with a generosity truly admirable. He made a sacrifice of all the suffrages, prayers, masses, indulgences, and mortifications which the society applies to her deceased members. He asked God to deprive him of them for the relief of the suffering souls most pleasing to his divine majesty. We have already spoken of Father Nuremberg, renowned as well for the works of piety, which he published as for the eminent virtue which he practiced. His devotion for the holy souls, not content with sacrifices and frequent prayers, urged him to suffer for them with a generosity which often amounted to heroism. There was amongst his penitents, at the court of Madrid, a lady of rank, who under his wise direction had attained a high degree of virtue in the midst of the world. But she was tormented with an excessive fear of death in view of purgatory, which follows it. She fell dangerously ill, and her fears increased to such a degree that she almost lost her Christian sentiments. Her holy confessor employed every means that his zeal could suggest, but to no purpose. He could not succeed in restoring her to tranquility, nor could he prevail upon her even to receive the last sacraments. To crown this misfortune, she suddenly lost all consciousness and was reduced to the last extremity. The father, unjustly alarmed at this peril of the soul, retired into the chapel near the chamber of the dying woman. There he offered the holy sacrifice with the greatest fervor to obtain for this sick person time sufficient to receive the last sacraments of the church. 
At the same time, prompted by truly heroic charity, he offered himself as a victim to divine justice to undergo during this life all the suffrages reserved for that poor soul in the next. His prayer was heard. The Mass was no sooner ended than the sick lady regained consciousness and found that she was entirely changed. She was so well disposed that she asked for the last sacraments, which she received with a most edifying fervor. Then her confessor, having told her that she had nothing to fear from purgatory, she expired perfectly calm and with a smile upon her lips. From that hour, Father Nuremberg was afflicted with all manner of sufferings, both body and soul. The remaining sixteen years of his life was one long martyrdom and a most rigorous purgatory. No human remedy could give him relief. His only consolation was in the remembrance of the holy cause for which he endured them. Finally, death came to terminate his terrible sufferings, and at the same time we may reasonably believe to open to him the gates of paradise, since it is written, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 39 Motives and Incentives to Devotion Towards the Holy Souls Examples of Generosity Examples of generous charity towards the departed are by no means rare, and it is always useful to recall them to mind. We may not omit the beautiful and touching example of St. Peter Damien, Bishop of Ostia, Cardinal and Doctor of the Church, an example which never wearies by repetition. While still young, Peter had the misfortune to lose his mother, and soon after his father marrying again, he was left to the care of his stepmother. Although she showed all possible affection for her, this woman was incapable of returning the love for this dear child. She treated him with barbarous severity, and in order to rid herself of him, sent him away to her eldest brother, who employed him to take care of the swine. His father, whose duty it was to have prevented this, left him to his unhappy fate. But the child lifted his eyes to heaven, where he saw another father, in whom he placed all his confidence. He accepted all that happened as coming from his divine hands, and resigned himself to the hardship of his situation. God, he said, has his designs in all that he does, and they are designs of mercy. We have but to abandon ourselves into his hands. He'll direct all things for our good. Peter was not deceived. It was in this painful trial that the future cardinal of the church, he who was to admonish his age by the extent of his learning, and to edify the world by the luster of his virtues, laid the foundation of his future sanctity. Barely covered with rags, his biographer tells us that he had not always sufficient to appease his hunger, but he prayed to God, and he was satisfied. Meanwhile, his father died, the youngest saint forgot the harshness with which he had been treated, and like a good son, prayed continually for the repose of his father's soul. One day he found upon the road a gold piece, which Providence seemed to have placed there for him. It was quite a fortune for a poor child, but instead of making use of it to relieve his own misery, his first thought was to carry it to a priest and beg him to celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass for the soul of his deceased father. Holy Church considers the trait of filial devotion so touching that she had inserted it at the length in the office of the feast. May I be allowed, says the missionary, Father Louvet, to add one more incident of my own personal experience. When I was preaching the faith in Cochinchina, a poor little Amorite girl, who had just been baptized, lost her mother. At the age of fourteen, she saw herself obliged to provide for her own support, and that of her two younger brothers, from her scanty earnings, which amounted to about eight sows, or about seven cents a day. 
What was my surprise when, at the end of the week, I saw her bring me the earnings of two days, that I might say mass for the repose of their dear mother's soul. Those poor little ones had fasted during a part of the week to procure this humble offering for the departed mother. O oh, holy alms of the poor and the orphans! If my own heart was so deeply touched by it, how much more so is the heart of our Heavenly Father! And what blessings it will have called down upon the mother and upon her children! Behold the generosity of the poor! What an example of reproach to so many of the rich, extravagant in luxury and pleasure! but miserly when it is there in question of giving alms to have masses celebrated for the deceased relatives. Although before all the other intentions they should devote part of their alms to have masses offered for their own souls or for their friends, it is proper to use a portion for it to relieve the poor or for other good works, such as for the benefit of the Catholic schools or propagation of the faith and other purposes according to circumstances. This is a holy liberality conformable to the spirit of the church and very profitable to the souls in purgatory. The Abbe Levet, from whom we have taken the above, relates another incident which deserves a place here. It concerns a man in humble circumstances who made a generous sacrifice in favor of the propagation of the faith, but under circumstances which rendered this act particularly valuable for the future needs of the souls in purgatory. A poor porter at a seminary during the long life had, penny by penny, amassed the sum of 800 francs. Having no family, he destined this sum for the celebration of masses after his death. But what can charity not effect when once it has inflamed the heart with its sacred fire? A young priest was on the point of quitting the seminary for the foreign missions. The old man felt himself inspired to give him his little treasure for the beautiful work of the propagation of faith. He therefore gave it and said, Dear sir, I beg you to accept this small alms to aid you in the working of spreading the gospel. I kept it to have masses said after my death, but I would rather remain a little longer in purgatory that the name of the good God be glorified. The seminarian was moved even to tears. He would not accept the too generous offer of the poor man, but the latter insisted so earnestly that he had not the heart to refuse him. A few months later, the good old man had died. No apparition has revealed his fate in the other world. But is he in need? Do we not know that the heart of Jesus cannot allow itself to be surpassed in generosity? Do we not understand that a man who has generous enough to consign himself to the flames of purgatory in order that Jesus Christ may be made known to infidel nations will surely have found abundant mercy before the sovereign judge?